Thank you very much, Hugh, and thank you for this invitation. Um, I think some of you know this is not my day job exactly, but uh, and it's, so it's a kind of I feel it's an honour to be given a slot uh, in this uh, possibly unique meeting about retrocausality. Um, yeah, a lot of my work does, um, professional work does hinge around um, nonlinear dynamical systems, and I want to try to present a perspective which I think is a, a bit different to what I've heard at least in the last day or so since I've been here um, about the Bell Theorem, trying to inject some ideas from, uh, well, from nonlinear dynamics, but in particular the global geometry the global state space geometry that such nonlinear dynamical systems manifest. Um, so, uh, whether or not you agree with what I'm about to say is obviously up to you, but I hope um, you'll sort of uh, at least cogitate in the weeks uh, to come about the sorts of concepts that these. Uh, dynamical systems bring to bear, because I think they do introduce some interesting uh, and novel perspectives into this very sort of, um, you know, long-standing problem about quantum interpretation foundations. Um, well, let me just start by showing a couple of very simple examples, well, actually one simple, the second not so simple, examples of what I mean by global invariant sets uh, from, from non-linear linear dynamical systems theory. It won't be obvious to you as I show these what this has to do with the topic of quantum mechanics, um, so that will, that will come a bit later. <clears throat> so here is almost um, a trivial example of a, of a nonlinear dynamical system which has uh, a state space um, which I've written, a two-dimensional state space which I've written in polar coordinates with a radia, radial um, variable and, a, and an angular variable. And in fact, the dynamical equations are not even coupled between the theta and the r direction. But you see the equation is, is nonlinear in the r direction. Now, if you were to start, if you just were to do an initial value problem and start pretty much anywhere in the phase space or, or the state space, I'm using the word phase and state space as pretty much independent, by the way, I tend to sort of lapse into one or the other, but I think of them as synonymous for the purposes of this talk. So if you start uh, with a point um, in the state space R and theta and just let it run, you'll eventually find that it becomes attracted to a, well, what dynam nonlinear dynamicists called a limit cycle, basically a circle at R equals one. So the system just goes round and round asymptotically. It, it's attracted onto this circle and just asymptotically goes round and round at r equals 1. Um, a limit cycle is not especially generic. Um, more generic are these um, fractal invariant sets for certain classes, at least of nonlinear dynamical system. So this is a rather famous one, the Lorentz equations. This is Lorentz without the t, um, who in 1963 came up with these three coupled uh, ordinary differential equations. Um, and uh, again, if you start with um, uh, any point in, in state space, x, y, z, and let the system run under those differential equations long enough, then um, eventually the state gets attracted onto this, um, well, this geometry which Lorentz took a long time to realize was a, a manifestation, not, not surprisingly, incidentally, um, of a fractal um, um, as I'll come on to show, I mean, like the limit cycle, this fractal also has uh, measure zero, zero measure. It's kind of, it, it occupies a negligible part of the total state space spanned by the x, y, and z um, directions. Um, locally, as you can perhaps sort of get an impression of, um, the structure of this um, invariant set. It's invariant in the sense that once you're on it, you're on it forever. And in fact, if you're on it, you have been on it forever. So it's invariant under the dynamics of the differential equations. Um, locally, it has the structure of these trajectories, which you can represent by the real line, since we're talking about differential equations, um, cross some sort of Cantor set. 
I'll say a bit more about Cantor sets a little bit later. Um, there's the interesting property which I think one doesn't come across much in, in physics, but people like Roger Penrose have made a big, um, a big issue of it, I think, in, in some of his works. This is actually a manifestation of, of something which is formally non-computable or non-algorithmic. In the sense that, um, if you just chose at random a point uh, in, the, in that state space and asked the question, does that point lie on that invariant set, you wouldn't actually be able to answer that question um, by doing any kind of finite um, algorithmic integration, for example, of those differential equations. In some sense, the, the fact that a point belongs to an invariant set is a kind of manifestation of the, of the whole global structure of the invariant set. It's not something that's decidable in, in, a, in a region. This is to do with the fractal structure. This wouldn't be true of the limit cycle I showed earlier. A theorem proved in a book by um, Steve Smale, who's one of the founding fathers of nonlinear dynamical systems and, and collaborators. One, by the way, one important point I want to make is that in both of those examples I've shown, if you were to calculate the um, uh, divergence of the velocities in state space, so dx dot by dx plus dy dot by dy plus dz dot by dz, you can very simply show from those equations, given the fact that sigma and beta are positive parameters, the divergence is everywhere negative. And that's the crucial point which allows trajectories to converge onto this um, invariant set generically. Now, um, when I give talks of this nature, I kind of sense there's a bit of a blank look amongst people's faces about what this has to do with, with uh, say, quantum physics or, in this case, retrocausality. So I want to show a, and strictly this is a, an analogy, which is the title of my talk about Schrodinger's black cat to try to um, illustrate at least one of the um, ideas I'm trying to get over here. Um, and because, uh, as I say, these kind of geometries are not sort of, I think, widely used, if, if at all, actually, in fundamental physics. But a type of global invariant set that perhaps people in this audience would be more familiar with are event horizons of black holes. So I want to um, sort of, as I say, as a way of sort of partially illustrating some of the, one of the important conceptual issues here, um, I want you to consider a, um, a thought experiment where you have a black hole. Uh, so there's the kind of space-time black hole. There's the singularity in the red. And some distance from the black hole is a massive object. Um, Okay, yeah, in this particular case, it's a massive object with a cat in it, but actually the cat, to be honest, is slightly irrelevant here. It's a massive object, and um, the, the link to Schrodinger's cat is that we're going to... Um, the fate of that massive object will be determined by the decay of a radioactive atom over a uh, sort of limited period of time, in the sense that if the radioactive atom decays over some limited period of time, then the massive object is, um, is propelled into the black hole. Um, and if the uh, radioactive atom doesn't decay, then the massive object stays some distance from the black hole. Um, and I'm going to assume that, indeed, we can describe the decay of the, of the radioactive atom by some kind of hidden variable lambda. So the question really is whether, whether at time t1 the radioactive atom decays or not, and that will be determined by lambda. Now, if the radioactive atom doesn't decay, then the um, solid line that I've drawn, um, so there's a pointer somewhere, um, if not, doesn't matter, um, describes pretty much the event horizon of the black hole. Um, but if the, radio, if the radioactive atom does decay, then um, that solid, the, the surface, uh, the, the null surface um, represented by the solid line, is no longer the event horizon of the black hole. And in fact, a null surface which 
looks like it's escaping out to infinity to, to scry plus um, actually is it becomes the event horizon and becomes trapped after this massive object falls into the black hole now you have to remember that the the notion of an event horizon is defined uh, first of all it is an invariant set in the sense that if you're a photon um, on on one of these null surfaces at this time you're on the null surface forever so it's invariant in that sense and it's also global because it's defined by a global condition. It's the boundary of the null surfaces which escape to scry plus. So it's the one which just doesn't quite escape to scry plus. Um, all right, so if the radioactive atom decays, this is the event horizon. Um, but the point is that one can go to, to much earlier times than T1 and find that the size, if you think the size of the black hole, let's, let's define the, the size of the black hole by the radius of the event horizon, then this radius of the event horizon um, will be correlated with, the, um, with this hidden variable. So in the sense that for lambdas where the radioactive decays, then the event horizon is larger. Um, now, because it's a, because it's a global um, uh, invariant set, very much like the Lorentz attractor, there's no finite algorithm. You can't uh, you know, measure the Riemann curvature of space-time in this area and feed it into some finite algorithm for determining where the event horizon will be. Like the uh, fractal set, there is no finite algorithm for determining <coughs> P belongs, you know, if a particular point in space-time belongs to the event horizon or not. So in this case, there is no, um, there is this correlation, if you like, backwards in time correlation between lambda and the size of the event horizon. But there's no, you don't need to invoke any, ex anything exotic, if you like, in the sense of retrocausality or some implausible conspiracy to explain that correlation. It merely arises um, because H plus, the event horizon, is defined by a global condition. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious in a sense. But if you, were, if you believe for some reason that you know, everything in physics has to be defined by finite uh, algorithms and in sort of terms of local properties, then, then you would you know, run into difficulties trying to explain this result. All right, so that's a kind of, uh, as I say, that's an analogy, because what I'm trying to talk about here are not things in space-time, but things in state space. Okay, so... Um, for this to make sense, I mean, I have to, if I'm talking about a dynamical system, I need to say what dynamical system uh, I'm referring to. And the, the idea really is to think of the whole universe uh, as a dynamical system. Um, I don't know whether that's a big leap of imagination or not, but um, it seems a kind of a, a reasonable thing to think about. Um, just think of everything as some, uh, some potential dynamical system. <coughs> Now, I'm going to assume here, and this, I'm coming to a major assumption in my work in a few minutes, but, but kind of part of this assumption is that the universe, in some sense, is, is uh, quasi-cyclic. So you have to just choose your own fa uh, favourite uh, cyclic cosmology. And then ask yourself the question, so here is a, if you like, the trajectory of the universe in, in its uh, state space, whatever that is, zillion dimensional state space, and uh, you know we're wherever we are here at the moment will come round um, and there'll be a new big bang and then a new eon of the universe and so on and so forth so let's just assume that is the case whatever the theory is that gives rise to that is another issue i want to ask the question pretty much like i asked the question for the um, limit cycle or the or the um, or the uh, lorentz attractor if you think of this as a trajectory of a dynamical system and you just let it go and go and go over numerous zillions of eons over and over. What sort of geometry is traced out by this, uh, by this dynamical system? Does it just fill out some big volume uh, in state space? Or is it ergodic? You know, does every possible conceivable um, point in state space eventually... Uh, is there eventually a trajectory which passes through that point? So that's the first question. Now I want to bring some additional constraints into this um, question. 
And I have to say this is very much motivated by work that Roger Penrose has um, pursued over many years. Um, so this is actually a, a figure which I think he's used many times in his books, but this was the one that came out of the famous volume from somewhere here in Cambridge of uh, Hawking and Penrose debating and discussing um, quantum gravity and such issues. So this also is a, a state space diagram of actually what he calls a Hawking box. So a big lump of matter um, with, with boundaries a long way away. But for the sake of, for the purposes of this discussion, this can be also thought of as the trajectories, this trajectory of the universe. And the point I'm, I'm trying to uh, make reference to here is the fact that he represents in this state space representation, the notion of black hole uh, information loss. I'm going to call it apparent information loss because there's some, you know, probably won't have time to get around to this, but there is subtleties here. But represent, let's call it black hole information loss by um, the, this convergence of trajectories. So here are, if you like, three possible black holes which um, in, in this state space where, you know, I don't know, the works of Shakespeare, um, some, some sort of bricks and uh, some, something else has been dropped in. And after a while, um, they basically converge to the same point in state space, indicating that whatever the information that existed before the objects were dropped into the black hole has somehow been lost. Now, you remember that I, by the way, I mean, Penrose also is a, it has this notion of objective state reduction, which he represents by this comp compensating divergence. I'm actually not going to make any use of this compensating divergence. I, I, I don't believe it's something that's necessary to understand quantum theory. But this convergence, on the other hand, I do think is important. So um, the reason I'm stressing this because is because it's, uh, it was an essential feature of the two simple examples I showed of um, the Lorentz attractor and the earlier limit cycle, that there is this notion of convergence. So this convergence is now being provided in a fundamental sense in this model by, by black holes when they form. So at the beginning here there will be no convergence, but as soon as you know stars have formed black holes and stuff, then this, this will start to occur. Now you can then put you can then sort of ask yourself, well, what are the key ingredients that lead to a fractal attractor like Lorentz? Well, you need instability. So, yeah. Just before you go on, I just, this is not uh, the information loss due to black hole evaporation. This is a, a purely classical. It's, well, yeah. Um, I think you can think of it purely as classical in the sense if you think of... Um, it's kind of a, a moot point, I suppose, but if you think of the information actually already being lost in a classical sense, in the sense it's lost in the singularity and from the outside you, you can't tell the difference between a black hole which has the works of Shakespeare or, or, or bricks thrown in, it, it's perfectly sensible to think of this purely in a classical sense. I think okay, so the, the, the thought is that the singularity is part of the continuum evolution? Or is the thought that the information is just hidden behind the hole? Well, look, I, I'm just I'm using this as a way of so the, the ideas I want to present require this notion of convergence. So I'm using I'm utilizing this notion that there might be something fundamental behind um, black hole information loss, which would link, which would uh, which would justify this. Now, whether you, you know, we can go into the details about this, but that's a slightly okay. separate point, I think. Um, so, yeah, so instability. Well, there are many instabilities, and in particular gravitational instability uh, exists in the dynamics of the universe. So we have instability, we have nonlinearity, um, we have this convergence. The other thing we need, um, actually, to get a fractal attractor over, say, a limit cycle or even a more simple fixed point invariant set is some large-scale forcing. Um, in the case of the Lorentz uh, attractor, it's actually provided by a temperature, large-scale temperature gradient, which kind of forces the system out of some steady state, which would be a fixed point. Um, now, in my view, that is plausibly provided by the fact that we have a positive cosmological constant. So 
the large scale forcing is, is in this picture is being provided by by positive lambda. So in some sense, therefore, I and that this is just I'm just saying this by way of um, plausibility to to really come to what is the key assumption in all of this work um, that. Um, what well, let's call them states of physical reality, the things that correspond to the laws of physics, describable by the laws of physics, are precisely those lying on um, a measure zero fractal subset. I'm calling it I sub U of the state space of the universe as a whole. So when we look at you know the Planck cosmic microwave background, we're looking at a state which is rather special in the state space of the whole universe. And this is what I'm calling the cosmological invariant set postulate. So everything I've said so far is really just by trying to provide some plausible argument for this. And I want to claim that this actually provides some quite um, novel perspectives on the problem at hand, which is the Bell theorem. Surprising as it may seem at this stage. Um, oh yeah, sorry, one other thing, um, it's kind of a neat thing, I think, that the acronym invariant set is, 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 because there is a certain, if you think about that example with the black hole, there is a certain timelessness here about this concept, um, you know, the fact that two things are a, are a zillion years apart is kind of an irrelevance for a lot of the arguments here, it's just the fact that this is a, is a, Geometry in state space. There's a sort of timelessness about it. Um, um, are yeah. you talking about three D state space? No, no, no. Certainly not. So I'm talking about. Time is included in I'm talking space. zillions of dimensions. I mean. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. I'm talking massive. But, um, uh, like Lorentz was three. Well, three dimensional. But the three dimensions are not space. They they just happen to be the three variables. You could think, if you like, in a sort of Hamiltonian sense, if you have n particles, it's six n or something. But I then also have to worry about. Potentially time gravitational. Is sort of special because time at this stage is just a. I'm going to say something about that, but time at this stage is just a param parameter along the trajectories of this um, of this dynamical system in this uh, let's call it six n dimensional space space. So yeah, very large, but we don't need to worry about precise numbers. Okay, um, just want to say this is. I've published about this a couple of times now. The first one was in Proceedings of the Royal Society a few years back. And just now, this paper's online in an Institute of Physics journal called Contemporary Physics. And it'll be actually in print, I think, uh, next month or a couple of months from now. And this is actually um, a lecture I gave in Oxford and at Trieste um, in honor of, um, or in memory of Dennis Sharma, who was actually my PhD supervisor in the 19. 70s. It's one of the Sharma Memorial Lectures. Um, yeah, so you can look at, I mean, I'm happy to send people copies if they're interested. Um, yeah, so I, I actually, the title actually brings in the fact that, um, you know, this is a sort of synthesis of ideas that Ed Lorentz brought to nonlinear dynamics and Roger Penrose certainly brought to fundamental physics. And Girdle's there in the middle because these Lorentz type attractors really do represent geometric manifestations of, of Gödel's theorem. One can frame, I mean, if, if you're into com computation theory, you can frame many of the classic uh, com computing problems which are not solvable by algorithm in terms of geometric, it has a, it's a kind of correspondence in terms of, of certain types of fractal geometry. It's a rather beautiful theory, actually, the, the relationship between computing theory and geometry. All right, so the simplest um, fractal set is the Cantor ternary set, which I guess everyone's familiar with. You take the unit line, you cross out the middle, you cross out the middle of the remaining bits, you cross out the middle of the remaining bits, blah, 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 and you have all these iterates, and then you take the intersection of all the iterates, and that's the set. Um, now, that's a specific construction, and there are many, 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 many different ways of, of sort of uh, making these types of sets. Um, but they all have a property, and, and this slide, in some sense, encapsulates the, the main idea I want to get over here, but I'm going to sort of flesh it out a bit in the remaining um, slides to give a bit more detail. 
but it kind of fleshes out some of the key ideas and it's I'm t I've entitled it with this word TARDIS duality so TARDIS will be known to all certainly British uh, people as the um, as the spaceship of choice of um, a certain time traveller called Doctor Who in the BBC TV um, series uh, Doctor Who which has been running for many decades ever since I was a kid um, and actually the, the time the, uh, the, the, the length of the series is manifest by the fact that he travels in this uh, thing which is actually what police used to use to call up their headquarters back in the 1950s before there were mobile telephones but if you go through the door of, the, uh, of this TARDIS it turns out to be uh, this magnificently uh, big spacious um, sort of intergalactic um, spacecraft so it's a fantastic uh, machine. So in other words, it looks incredibly small and insignificant from the outside, but incredibly big and, uh, and spacious from the inside. Um, and so uh, something like a Cantor set is, it, 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 it's very um, big, this is big on the inside, so it has the cardinality of the continuum, it has as many points as the real line itself has. Um, it's what's called a perfect set, which means that if you take any point uh, in the Cantor set and draw a little neighbourhood around it, um, no matter how small that neighbourhood is, there will be other points, in fact there will be a continuum of other points um, in that, uh, that neighbourhood. Now I say that, and, and so technically one would say it has no isolated points. I say that because this links to this notion of, um, I think, super determinism. Um, one of them, I have to say, is a slightly um, sort of tangential remark. One of the frustrations I find um, in, in discussing this with, with colleagues is um, words like uh, de super determinism and, and, and free will is another one, actually, and um, maybe fine tuning and things like that. Um, people seem to have different uh, definitions of what these words mean. Um, I, I, wish, I wish somebody would write the definitive uh, definition of, of some of these phrases so that. Um, <coughs> It would certainly help me with some of the discussions. But for me, a super deterministic theory is one, in a sense, where, I mean, the dynamics is deterministic, but also, if you like, your initial state is, is very special in the sense that you can't uh, perturb it to another initial state. So one way of saying that mathematically is that if you had a, a dynamical system where the points in the directions transverse to the trajectories were isolated points, then that, for me, would be a definition, a mathematical definition of something super deterministic, because you had no, then you would have no freedom, at least for small perturbations. Now, you can think in a philosophical sense, these small perturbations would correspond to counterfactual worlds. They'd say, well, you know, if I want to move in a particular state space direction, which would correspond to somebody changing the, you know, some measurement setting on, a, on an experiment. So you'd say, well, here's the state of the universe. I'm going to perturb it now in a direction corresponding to uh, uh, um, keeping everything fixed except changing the, some, some measurement setting. So that, that would be a sort of small perturbation in some direction in state space. Now, if, you had a, if, you had, if the points were isolated points in state space, then, then you know, those, those counterfactual perturbations don't exist. And a super deterministic system is one where essentially it's totally counterfactually void. There's nothing, it's, it's isolated. So any perturbation, small perturbation at least, will, 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 will take you to a, to a part of state space where by, by construction the trajectories don't exist. Now it's not like that. The Cantor set's not like that, so I would claim it's not a super deterministic theory. So people often say to me at the end of oh yeah, but yours, yours is just super determinism. It's, I would claim it's not super determinism. But ultimately, making a judgment about that depends on us having a good definition of what we really mean by super determinism. So I, that's my definition, but people can come up with other ones. So because the Cantor set is a perfect set, it, it's not like that. And what I'm going to claim is that it has enough structure. Um, to first of all to give rise to the notion of probability so one can talk about counterfactuals and look at uh, probability distributions in some small neighborhood but more say um, more um, sort of uh, conjecturally let's more um, surprisingly perhaps you I would claim also that it can actually describe quantum probability 
Now, on the other side of the coin, so that's, uh, that's looking at it from the inside where it's the sp spacious galactic uh, spaceship, um, looking at it from the outside, it's a tiny insignificant um, thing in, in the big, uh, wide Euclidean state space of the universe. And in particular, then, this is sparse enough, um, and, it, and technically it has measure zero, um, and this is what I really want to claim in this talk, that the specific uh, counterfactual states that you need to establish to derive the bell or the clauser horn inequality. So this is, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater by throwing away all counterfactuals, but the specific ones needed to establish the, uh, the, the bell inequality are those which will take you off this particular invariant set. Now that leads to essentially a partial violation of, of the measurements. And I stress the word partial, it's not complete violation, but partial violation of measurement independence. But I want to claim that this is done in a perfectly plausible, if you like, or scientifically, mathematically justifiable and, and physically plausible way. Okay, now, what I've talked about so far are, well, the, the examples I've shown are both, um, if you like, Newtonian. The uh, Lorentz attractor was derived from just thermally, thermally convecting fluid, so it's essentially Newtonian. And clearly here we want something, well, clearly here we want something relativistic. So I want to, um, so you can ask the question, how would you go about constructing an invariant set that was relativistically invariant? Now, what I'm going to try to do is, is exploit the group homomorphism from, from the SL2C to the Lorentz group. In other words, I want to exploit um, the notion of of complex geometry as a very primitive um, aspect of physics if we aspire to produce things which are Lorentz invariant. But this complex geometry, I'm going to uh, present it in a rather unusual kind of way. Um, and I'm going to present it as a way to, as I say, to generate or describe this um, invariant set. I want to try and do this in a simple way, so not to bombard you with too many technical details. So I'm going to leave out a lot of stuff here. But I just want to give you a flavour of this. So first of all, let me just show you something which is purely algebraic and rather simple. So here's a set containing four binary elements, A1, A2, A3, A4. Um, and so any one of those elements could either be a red dot or a black dot. And let me introduce a, a negation operator which takes a red dot to a black dot or a black dot to a red dot. And then let me define this operator I acting on this bit string, which, um, which is defined in the following way. So it permutes the elements and it negates some of the elements. Well, if you, you can almost do this in your head. If you were to apply I again to this bit string, then you would actually end up with all the elements back in their original order um, with every element negated. So I could define that as the uh, negation of S. And um, I could go in the other direction and define a, a square root operator uh, in this way and it, it would be well defined because if I apply that operator twice I get back to this thing I. So I already have some notion of, uh, of complex number, of multiplicative structure of complex numbers here, at least in a very granular sense of i, i to the half, and i squared. And what I'm going to do is use them to define a kind of um, um, evolutionary structure of a, of a fractal. So the, the Cantor ternary set just took um, the unit interval and shrunk it by a factor of three. Here I'm going to take the unit interval and shrink it by a factor of 20. And I'm going to consider a kind of evolution of this fractal from one where the points are represented by um, four, uh, five groups of four here. This is supposed to be at some initial time. And evolving to one where, the, where these uh, sh shrunken elements are now grouped into two groups of 10. And the dynamics are represented by these lines, the, the dynamical sort of time evolution. So time is now running actually down the page here. Um, 
And this, this dynamical structure is actually defined by these representations of um, the square root of minus 1. And in particular, all the, all the dots here on this side are red, and all the dots here on this side are black. The dots here are labelled um, red or black according to whether the points are, um, w whether the arrow joins a dot here to a black dot or to a red dot. And basically, the way it works is you just take these um, groups of four symbols and apply the, uh, this square root of minus one operator, first of all with the, uh, super, with the um, power exponent zero and then to the half. So if you remember, um, the definition of i to the half negated one of the elements, i negates two of the elements, i to the three halves negates three of the elements, and i squared negates all four elements compared to the identity. So what this is describing in dynamical, sing uh, d dynamical systems language is a kind of symbolic dynamic representation of a, of a kind of riddle basin, basins of attraction. So you think of these as two attractors on the invariant set, and the system is either evolving to one or the other. But at this interface, there's a kind of, um, there, there's a kind of instability here where, where the, 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 the state could either go this way or this way. There's a kind of what they call riddled or intertwined basins of attraction. It's a very common type of structure in, in nonlinear dynamics. Um, as the system, if you take a kind of a probability distribution, um, the probabilities are conserved, so there's an equal number of red and black points up here at the initial time, there's an equal probability of red and black points at the final time where you, we, I've evolved this probability distribution using this dynamics. So in other words, this is satisfying a kind of Louisville type of equation for conservation of, prob of probability. This is just a mapping from uh, your set of 20. Yes, itself. yes, exactly. Uh, so this fractal, what I've done, the fractal itself has not changed in terms of its uh, fractal dimension, but it's kind of what's called lacunarity or gappiness has, has changed. It's gone more clumpy. I'm going to say physically what this means in a, in a few minutes. Um, now, I don't want to, again, I don't want to get bogged down in sort of technical stuff here, but I, I need to talk about a couple of um, sort of generalizations of all this. One is that it's easy with these four elements to go beyond just simple complex numbers to quaternions. So again, if I take these three um, Op to find these three operators acting on these bit strings in, the, in this way. You find each of them is in fact a square root of minus one, each e, j is a square root of minus one, um, and also, but also they satisfy the quaternionic um, multiplication rule. Now the other thing which I'm not going to give any details on is that this is very trivial to generalize for when s is two to the n elements rather than just two to the two elements. Um, and what you end up with when you do that is you can define whole families of these quaternionic operators and they're labeled by this index beta. And you can also define, you know, square root like I did for i, square roots and quarter roots and eighth roots and sixteenth roots and everything you like. But with the, the criterion, this is a crucial criterion, that if s has two to the n elements, these alpha and beta must be describable by n bits. In particular, they must be rational, base two rational numbers. Um, these operators can be written in a kind of matrix representation, and it's very easy then to relate them to things like Pauli spin matrices and Dirac gamma matrices. But I'm not going to dwell upon that in this talk. Um, I just got, I think, one more sort of technical slide which I want to put over. You can actually make a correspondence between these bit strings and elements of, of a Hilbert space. Um, and the correspondence is given by these two equations. So the correspondence between alpha and the theta of, of the Hilbert space and the phase angle phi and, and beta is given here. But it's very important, if not absolutely crucial, to understand that this is not a, a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence because um, as I said, alpha and beta must be describable by n bits. So that means that cos through this correspondence, cos theta and phi divided by pi must also be describable by n bits. And in particular, they must be base two rational. 
So the correspondence is, a, it, 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 there's, there's a correspondence, if you like, for every alpha and beta, I can write a correspondence to an element of a Hilbert space. But the converse is not true. There'll be values of theta and phi where, where there's no correspondence to one of these bit strings. Now there's also a very second, very crucial point here, which I, is a technicality, which I'm not going to discuss at, at a technical level, but just state it as a fact that um, you can define easily metrics on bit strings. There are things like Hamming, if you're familiar with this stuff, Hamming metrics and so on. So you can talk about the notion of continuity in this bit string space. And it turns out in this construction that these bit strings are not continuous relative to this parameter beta or by this correspondence, the parameter phi. Now the Hilbert space is a sort of continuous space. So one would have to say that this correspondence, in this correspondence, the complex Hilbert space arises as a singular limit. It's not a smooth limit or a regular limit um, of the space of bit strings as this n parameter tends to infinity. And this actually links to um, uh, kind of some philosophical issues which Michael Berry has raised in some of his papers that often old theories uh, do not arise as the sort of smooth limit of new theories. Um, um, I mean, in some sense, I suppose one could say quantum theory is not um, the smooth limit of, of classical theory um, in any sense. Um, but he sees that as a very kind of reassuring and creative thing. This one is something actually one should be, in general, expecting. So the fact that this, the complex Hilbert space is, is not the sort of smooth limit of anything here is, is an important property of what I want to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to show, uh, I think I'll just show something from, I want to come on to Bell's theorem in a few minutes, but just show one thing, which is um, the stern gerlach sequential stern gerlach experiment, which is often used in textbooks to describe the mysteries of quantum mechanics. Um, I want to just show you what this would look like from, a, uh, from this kind of invariant set picture. Um, first of all, if you didn't look, um, if, you, if you looked at it in a rather coarse way, so used a, an iterate of the fractal where, where you weren't really seeing that much structure, then it would look very much like um, trajectories splitting off. So here's a trajectory of a particle that um, goes through the stern gerlach and is, and is detected by A. And here's a trajectory um, of a particle which actually moves through into the next uh, stern gerlach apparatus. And then here's another splitting where it goes to B or, or perhaps moves. And here's another splitting where it, this one goes and either goes to D or C. So this looks a little bit like a kind of many worlds, I think, picture where you see the splitting. But actually, there is no splitting at all because if you um, zoom in, for example, to a high level of iterate, then you see, in fact, what looked like one trajectory is actually two from different bits of the fractal. Um, so here, this one is the one that goes off to A. And here's a tra this trajectory now is separate to A, but it doesn't really distinguish B, C, and D. But zoom in a second time, and now you can distinguish the one that went to B from the one that went on to C or D. And zoom in again, and you can uh, distinguish D and C. Um, I don't have time to show this, but from what I'm going to show in a minute about the Bell theorem, one can actually show, one can derive the incommensurateness of these spin operators or the, the commutation, what would be the com non commutivity of spin operators associated with these two measurements from the fractal structure of this uh, invariant set. Um, I think, I hope that this might come out in a few minutes, but. Um, so, so, in some sense, it looks at, a, at, a, at, a, at one level like many worlds, but actually. It's not. It's, uh, there's no splitting. They're just separate trajectories. And the other important point to make is these are actually not many worlds. This is the same world. This is our universe. It's just evolved. Um, this, this, this universe here, or this trajectory here, is a state of our universe, which is the same universe as the one here, but it's just many eons into the future. It's where it's come back. It's evolving around this sort of compact fractal invariant set. So there's not many worlds. It's just one world. So these worlds are incredibly far apart in terms of, if I could use Bohmian language, because this is, I think, quite useful. These worlds are incredibly far apart in terms of the explicate time parameter. 
but they're sort of close together in terms of the implicate uh, cantor, um, cantor distance, if you like. So I think this is a rather nice way of thinking about this Bohmian implicate and explicate order. Not that I'm ad advocating Bohmian dynamics here, just using that language. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to perhaps I'm going to move over that one. I just want to come straight now to the to the Bell theorem. I'm going to talk about the sim start with the simple Bell theorem, and then just move on to the Clauser Horn one. Um, so if we want to know whether our pet hidden variable theory is constrained by this inequality. Um, we have to assume that for a given hidden variable lambda, um, each of these three correlation functions um, are well defined. I mean, in a sense, that, that's implied by measurement independence. But as you know, what I'm trying to do is provide a plausible model where this actually might fail. Um, all right, so, okay, let's just backtrack a minute. So this is this is an experiment where Alice measures with respect to a direction A, Bob with respect to direction B. Now when we do experiments, of course, we, we calculate these correlations on separate samples of particles. But to establish whether my theory is constrained by this experiment, I need to essentially talk about... I mean, this might be the actual... this might correspond to an actual experiment that is done, in which case these would have to correspond to counterfactual experiments ones that might have been done but weren't on that particular uh, set of lambda values. So let's assume Alice does in fact measure with respect to A and Bob with respect to B. We then have to ask the question, in according to my theory, does that allow Alice to have measured with respect to A and Bob with respect to C? And does it also allow Bob, Alice to have measured with respect to B and Alice with respect to C? Now I want to show that that's not the case in this theory. Um, I think I might. So if you remember, so what I'm going to do here is represent these three directions by points on this. This is a unit sphere. Um, and if you remember, the theory requires that um, if, if, uh, if theta, so sorry, in this example, P, A is corresponding to the point P and B is corresponding to point uh, B is corresponding to point P prime, that's right. So the, um, if you like, the, the, ang the angle between Alice and Bob uh, as ap apparatus is represented by this angle theta P, pr P, P prime. And the theory requires the cosine of that, this invariant set theory requires the cosine of that, if you remember this correspondence between the bit strings and the Hilbert space directions, um, to be describable by n bits. So let's assume that that is the case. So let's assume that that is the experiment that's done. Um, so by definition, that's an experiment on the invariant set and cos theta p, p prime is describable by n bits. So that's all fine. And, and that's, that, that term there in the Bell inequality is, is defined. So that's good. All right, so let's move on now to this term here, which is, a, is the first of our counterfactuals. So Alice has stayed with A and Bob now as C. So this is this direction, so C is P, P double prime. So this, we require this angle here to be describable, the cosine of this angle, sorry, this, the cosine of this angular distance to be describable by n bits. Well, we can, we can arrange for that. We, we'll, we'll just, by, by construction, make sure P, P double prime is, is at a point on the sphere where that is definitely true. All right, so this term is also fine. But now we've got, we've now got to look at this last term. So this now, um, looking at the, the sort of great circle which joins P prime and P double prime, which completes this spherical triangle. Um, we've now kind of fixed, we've got no freedom now to jiggle P prime and P double prime around. So if we want this uh, to be well defined, it better be the case that this distance here also, this angular distance also has a cosine describable by n bits. Um, this angle phi is the angular distance between p prime and p double prime. Now this is the cosine rule for spherical triangles and I'm going to sort of completely miss out now a bit of number, essentially number theory. It's quite neat number theory. 
Um, but basically, one can show that if the, the, the first two, well, the first term of this spherical, this is the spherical triangle rule for P prime, P double prime. So this first term are, is the product of two terms which by construction are rational. But the number theory tells us that this third term is, is going to be irrational. So you sum an irrational and an irrational number and you get something that's uh, irrational. So it means that according to this theory, although these two terms are well defined, the third term isn't. Um, the same thing pretty much happens for the Clouser horn, but it's a bit more complicated because now you have four different directions to think about rather than three, so you've got more than one triangle and so on and so forth. But just to cut a long story short, you can look at what's allowed and what's not allowed. And so, and let's, so let's, assume that, let's assume that in the real world, Alice um, decides that she wants to measure uh, with respect to A, and Bob decides that he wants to measure with respect to B prime. Now, in variant set theory, that's, that's fine. Um, they can do what they want to do. They're free agents in that respect. I think one could talk about them having free will, if you like. Um, there's certainly no constraints, not, there's no knowable constraints telling them that's not possible. So in the situation where they do, where they do choose that, then that already locks in this invariant set structure to prevent other possibilities which are required by this inequality. Um, it, it allows this one, actually, A prime B, so a counterfactual where she, Alice, measured with respect to A prime and Bob with respect to B. That's allowed by this construction. But the one where she measured with respect to A and Bob B is not allowed, or indeed the one where she measured with respect to A prime and B prime is not allowed. And again, it's just to do with this irrationality versus rationality. In other words, these are, these are on the invariant, if that's on the invariant set, then that's on the invariant set, but that's not on the invariant set, and that's not on the invariant set. So I think um, I'm going to just take two more slides and then finish. Um, in my view, this does provide a, um, a new way of thinking about the, the Bell experiment, and I want to kind of come back to the original uh, example that Bell himself raised as a way of sort of illustrating this notion of, of conspiracy, where we set the um, we set the measurement measurement uh, systems by not by Alice and Bob's sort of volition or what they want to do, but by pseudo random number generators. And in particular, I'm going to use Bell's uh, notion that uh, you know whether a or a prime or b or b prime gets set is sensitive to the millionth digit of the input to these two pseudo-random number generators. All right, so here's the millionth digit of the input to this pseudo-random number generator. It's, a, it's the digit six. And let's assume, for the sake of argument, that with that millionth digit set at six, that selects or ensures that A is selected. This, by the way, could be run, you know, a thousand years before the experiment is done. The time, again, this sort of the time issue is, is kind of slightly irrelevant in this argument because it's all to do with these invariant sets. Um, and let's assume that the pseudo-random number generator on this side um, is a seven, and that and that happens to select B prime. Okay. Now Bell's argument is that whilst the um, number six indeed is crucial for determining whether it's A or A prime, he says, well, surely it can't be relevant, you know, for anything else in the world. It's kind of a, it's such an insignificantly, pathetically small uh, number. It can't be the crucial piece of information for anything else in the world, like uh, Lambda or whatever. But I think you can see, I hope that um, in this picture I'm trying to present, Indeed, it could well be the crucial piece of information for a lot of other things, in the sense that, um, let's, let's assume that this is the case, this is the fact of the matter um, in, our, in our universe. Um, and now, by, so A is selected and B prime is selected. Now, from those rationality of the triangles, this means that 
a situation or a world where A prime is, for, for this given lambda, where A prime is selected and B prime is still selected. That would correspond to a world which would not lie on this invariant set by the construction. And therefore, in particular, if it's the case that perturbing the six parameter to the, sorry, the six digit to the seven digit um, causes A prime to be selected rather than A, and we'll keep this one the same unchanged. Because this, if you like, lies in the basin of attraction of the A prime selection, and the seven lies in the basin of attraction of the B prime, then a situation where the seven variable was the, was, was, was the one that occurred as the input to the pseudo random number generator, in fact, the seven for both, that would necessarily correspond to a world which lies off this invariant set. And if we're stating that states of physical reality are precisely those which lie on this invariant set, then, um, then, this, is the, then, you know, then this is not a state of, of physical reality. Therefore, um, therefore, the theory is not constrained. Well, the theory is not constrained by the Bell inequalities, but in particular, it, 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 it makes one understand why changing this from a 6 to a 7 is a very sort of existential perturbation. It's not just some trivial perturbation which only affects A and A prime. It affects whether or not the state of the universe lies on this invariant set or not. Um, it, I, the only talk I heard yesterday which had resonated a little bit with me uh, in this respect is Joe Henson's talk where he... Um, not here, no. He had this um, picture of a lady dressed in a scout uniform. Do you remember that? And um, she could, uh, she sort of switched over between A and A prime. And he had this kind of toy model, which, uh, where in a situation where she switched from A to A prime, suddenly Bob sort of mysteriously disappeared, you know, kind of vanished in a puff of smoke. Um, and he, he said he had a toy model. Well, actually, that comes, I think, closest to, to the idea I'm trying to get over here, that there is this constraint. And if you try to do the, uh, you know, the lady pressing the switch is, a, is, is sort of moving to this counterfactual world where she actually did A, but, but now she thinks, what would have I done if I'd done A prime? And, and doing that, in some sense, causes the whole universe to disappear in a puff of smoke because it's a perturbation which is taking you off this invariant set. Okay, I'm um, sorry, I lied, I've got just two more slides and I'll finish. Um, I thought I might just show this because I thought it was, there was some discussion the day I arrived on unitarity. And I'd just like very briefly to um, try to put my ideas in the context of other theories. Um, in standard quantum theory with, with decoherence, I mean, the whole, everything is unitary. But I want to sort of stress that there are unitary transformations are used in two different ways. They're used to map, if you like, real-world time evolutions, and, it's, and they describe conservation of probability in real-world time evolutions. But they also allow you to move to counterfactual worlds. They say, well, okay, I measured, I did the measurement with respect to X, but what would have happened if I had measured with respect to uh, Y or something like that? Um, so a, a unitary transformation is also, in standard quantum theory, the thing that, that allows you to talk about counterfactual worlds. Um, I think there was talk about GRW and stuff like that. So, and, and of course, Penrose's stuff is also uh, along these lines of non-unitary uh, time evolution during measurement. But they still retain this notion, because it's all based on Hilbert space pre-measurement, that you can talk about these ca counterfactual worlds with, with sort of impunity, and they're defined by just doing unitary measurements to a different basis in your Hilbert space. Um, I, I like to think of my ideas as kind of some, you know, like a third way, if you like. It sounds a bit Blairite, like that, which is a bit horrible, but I shouldn't mean it that way. Um, but anyway, a third idea, which, um, which is that, in fact, the evolution on the invariant set is probability conserving. So you can talk about it as, as unitary. But it's this kind of, where, the non, where, where it departs from these things is where you think about how to move to the transformations associated with counterfactual states and uh, what I'm trying to claim is that the, in particular the class of transformations to counterfactual states needed to derive the Bell inequalities are certainly non-unitary. 
So I just want to finish with this slide, um, which, which could be the topic of another talk, but I won't go into it. Because people sometimes say to me, why, I mean, why are you doing all this stuff anyway? I mean, as I say, it's not really my day job. It's not what I'm paid to do, at least. Um, but I was a student of Dennis Sharma's back in the 70s, and I did become a very, I have to say, sort of disillusioned with standard approaches to quantum gravity. And um, I guess thinking about these ideas has clarified a lot my own um, view about what we should be doing uh, to try to marry quantum mechanics and, um, and, um, and gravitation theory. And I kind of feel that the whole phrase quantum theory of gravity is rather putting the cart before the horse because it assumes that we have this preeminent theory called quantum theory and that we need to somehow you know, cram gravity or push it through the machinery to, to get it, the quantum side. But this picture which I showed earlier, my view is that this describes a kind of a gravitational clumping, gravitational instability. I mean, this is the measurement process, the collapse, if you like, to, eig to two eigenstates. But, but at a fundamental physical level, I see this as a representation in state space of gravitational instability and gravitational clumping. So I'm very much in favor of things that Penrose and, and Diyoshi and others have, have, and to some extent GRW, about the role of gravity in the measurement process. But I think more importantly, what I'm trying to say here is that perhaps there's a need to um, extend general, the, the, gra the geometric ideas in general relativity from, from uh, space-time into state-space. So we need a more generalized theory of gravity. And from that, quantum theory then, in this kind of sing in in Berry's singular limit sense, quantum theory would be emergent and quantum physics would be emergent from this. So in other words, instead of looking for a quantum theory of gravity, really I think what we should be doing is looking for a gravitational theory of the quantum. 